my mother, if she was born in Texas a little while after the Civil War, she had two invalid children. She never let them go to a home. Neither one of them could walk. One of them couldn't feed himself, the boy. She killed herself lifting the boy when he's 39 years old. Her inspiration to me was such that I thought, well, if she can do that without losing her temper, without losing that, going crazy, sure, I can do something. So I thought, well, I'll just stay down here and try to help make these hills a little a brighter place for my friends, my little friends. Some places I would have done a little different if I, differently if I had to do over again, but I guess everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes I get to feeling so little, I just don't know whether I want to keep going or not. I'm ashamed of myself. Being such an insignificant speck. There's nothing but mystery in this life. Mystery, all of it is mystery. I've lived here in the Shawnee Hills, the lower tip of Illinois, all my life. In fact, I was born in the here in a log cabin. I grew up here, I raised my family here, I expect to make this my home as long as I live. Well, the longest job I had here was uh, a rural mail carrier. I had 67 miles of these hills, unbridged streams, big mud holes, rocky cliffs. Warm enough for you to go down here? Well, I'm about to burn up, aren't you? <laughs> it's real warm. Yes, sir. How is it on the hill? Did you get boat away the other yeah, night? Oh, a lot of, lot of trees rolled down. It didn't too, run too bad. While I was on this mail route, I had a chance to talk to a lot of people, and uh, I kind of got the impression that they would all like to do something together in the hills here. Oh, well, we're protected pretty well here in this steep valley, but on the hill, it blew a lot of trees down. It was rough out, out of town a little piece here. Protect you know, that went to St. Louis, too. I oh, called up part oh, in St. Louis, and they had oh, it in St. Louis. Same storm. And yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the last one, I didn't put the man's gas cap on it. I better put this one on. Now, don't run over the man's cart. Well, I won't. Get them all to work together, do a little something so they have a personal interest in it. So that's when I got the idea to build the big cross from Ball Knob Mountain. So we decided to have an Easter service on Ball Knob Mountain. So uh, we fashioned a cross out of two befores for our first service there in 1937. It looks so pretty that we decided to build a larger one there. I used several methods to raise money to build the cross. The farmers here in southern Illinois didn't have much money, but I figured that they would raise a couple of pigs if I would uh, give them to them. And when they sold them, they'd donate the money to the fund. I got a contract to take rough fish out of Crab Orchard Lake, which I worked uh, evenings and sold over the country. And I uh, put crosses on the under the skins of ap red apples by pasting opaque crosses on them when they were green. So when it was finally built, it was by the work and help of uh, 70,000 people of every Christian denomination. The, the completion of the cross in 1964, when they finally finished it, was a culmination of 26 years of my spare time work. I've turned all the activities of the Ball of Easter Service and Care of the Cross over to the new group, which calls themselves the Cross of Peace Foundation. I don't have anything to do with the programs or the management of it at all, giving them full sway. But they still think that I still think that I kind of influence them to see. Oh man, Presley, he's out there trying to run things here. <laughs> I don't try to run things. I didn't want to put a cross over on Ball Knob and said this one's going to have to have so much maintenance. So I'd stand up after I was going and wouldn't say, well, the pressure started this and here he left it for us to worry over. 
vandals keep breaking the lights out over there in storms, blow panels off the cross. And it's creating so much trouble, it's costing so much to keep it in repair, that I proposed to the foundation that they let me take it down and build an old rugged cross out of three huge blocks of sandstone to be hewn out of the neighborhood bluffs. Well, they thought I'd gone off the deep end. They wouldn't let me. They were in debt and crying for money. And I told them, I said, go right ahead now, you folks. I thought you could keep it up. When you get tired of it, it falls down on you, you can't repair it. Well, let me know when I'll move it out and put, put sandstone on it. I started Presley Tours after I retired from the mayor out at 62 years old in 1960. And nearly lost my home on the first venture. I put up several thousand dollars for reservations for hotels in Miami Beach and for a train to go down there and back. I nearly lost my home work. Well, hi, yes, well, I guess so. <laughs> but uh, things worked out unbelievably well. And now, in July here in 1980, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary here in Nashville with about 600 people we brought down with us. Oh, yeah, you did. I fell in a bit of that time, yeah. I wish you'd told about that dog chasing that freak Oh, I felt good. Before I started this tour of Venice, I hoboed through the country. I'd uh, go to Trash Bear when I get to town and hunt me out a Wall Street Journal. Well, I'd stick that paper in his pocket, you know, so cops could see it. They'd see it and then walk through that the Wall Street Journal in his pocket, but it ain't even be too much of a whole more. <laughs> well, from my country home way back in the hills down here, uh, I learned to amuse myself with nature. Everything is around me. Pretty soon the neighborhood kids would want to go with me and then their parents and kept building up. I used to take all kinds of groups, all sizes out for hikes in the woods. And they'd begin to come from farther away, as far as Chicago, and follow me out and I could show them some interesting things around in these old hills. But they, they've been hanging on to life for years and years and years. And they, the wood gets harder. The older a tree is, and the less, the slower it grows, the harder it's wood. So those little fellows that have hanged on up there, hung on, or whatever you call it, city, they have the wood in them, the kind that violins are made out of, that play music for the world. But they said to us one time, let's go see the ocean. And I, oh, I said, we never, we can't go there too far away. Oh, raise the price a little. We'd like to go see the ocean. This is fun. We're all guests, we fine people, and we had a lot of fun. And so the next year we took 17 buses, 17 bus loads of them. Part of the West Coast and part of the East Coast. Apparently, just evolved into this business here now. Multi million dollar business here in these hills without ever leaving. Mr. Presley, what do you want to do about these people who have relations with us to go to Russia? We'll send uh, all their money back, Grace, including their deposits, and explain to them that when the president decided to boycott the Summer Olympics in Moscow, that we decided to cancel all trips into Russian territory everywhere in sympathy of his decision. Okay, thank you very much. Well, this is one of my favorite spots in the South because this old gentleman was one of us. He's a hillbilly like the rest of us. I, I call him that. He's the first commoner to ever be president, as this gentleman has told us. And he's the first man, I guess, and the last man to, to make the government pay off. What I mean, when they got he through, he wasn't punch. in debt. Yeah, yeah, I cleared the debt. I think we ought to dig him up and see if we couldn't put him in again. <laughs> <laughs> later, later on, we found out that that railroad he came down to Nashville on was a ball bash. And the train that he was on was a Wabash Cannonball. And I'm sure you're not going to let him leave this room if he don't come up here and just sing a word or two about the Wabash Cannonball. How about that, folks? <laughs> Roy Acuff, one of the great men of the world, one of the great, my favorite entertainer in this whole world, 
and you see his mansion tomorrow overlooking the Grand Ole Opera across the river. You see that big house up there? That's his. All right, Roy, let's have you. Mr. Presley, anything you'd ask me to do, I would, have, I would feel compelled to have to do it, I'll tell you that. You're, you're such a great man yourself to have uh, brought so many people here to visit with us at the Grand Ole Opry, and I think the best thing we could all do is to chip in and erect a monument for you here somewhere, <laughs> better than me standing up here talking. <laughs> From the great Atlantic Ocean to the wide Pacific shore, from the queen of flowing mountains to the sound of bells. Okay, we'll get on the network. Well, uh, he's not too big a hurry, so hello to him, both of them. Thank you. We'll have a good time. So that ends our little program for, the Saturday, for this evening. Uh, that is as far as the introductions here are concerned. Say hello to the gentlemen as they leave, if you have time. So go right ahead with your punch and visitations. I don't mean that it's time to leave. I want to make my promise to you. Remember in Switzerland, I said we'll never go on a tour except with Presley, well, and you I, just laughed, and we never have. We have good We talked for just wherever we go. I'll buy, I'll buy we all the coke and we spit it Saturday night. We celebrate. Well, have you met Mabel Griswold? No. You haven't met her? No. You couldn't tie him down. And I admire him for being that way because. Uh, it would, uh, having the mind that he has and the energy that he has that he wants to do these things, it would be miserable for him not to do it if he were at home all the time. There had been times that I think, oh my, to get away from it. I'd like to present our table here. These are the members of my family that actually own and run the business. I'm just the old man kind of hanging around anymore. And we, Miss Tressie, would you stand up, please? Uh, she has put up with me for 58 years. A uh, reason she's held up so well and looks so young at her age because I furnished her with everything she needed when we was first married. I got her a hoe and a churn and, <laughs> and a chopping axe. <laughs> when, when you know it's work that your husband loves to do and enjoys doing, you, you if you have any compassion, you go along with it. My wife's trying to get me to retire again, and uh, she's building a new room onto our home here and fitted it up with all kinds of conveniences for me, typewriter and tables and reclining, vibrating chairs and everything. She's trying to make it appetizing for me to take another retirement. She's not had much luck so far. Well, he says as long as you can keep your mind busy, why, he said, it stimulates your blood and your brain thinking. He always likes to look forward. He don't look back. He wants to look forward to things to come, to what he can do. Now, this mind sharpener, I call it. I'm looking forward to that. Each one of those pegs have a number. The idea is people of any age, they start counting these clicks slowly, check to see if they're accurate, you go a little faster, a little faster, a little faster, and pretty soon they can count them just about as fast as you can click. And they sharpen their mind, just like sharpening an ax or a hole with a file.
27. Try it again. Pretty good. You could take it up front. <clears throat> Each one of the students would have a piece of paper, sheet of paper with the figures, one, two, three, four, five, up to maybe a hundred or more. And you have a class, regular class, you say, all right, number one. It has numbers here as you see figures along there. And you start this and you start slowly first. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You stop. You write on your sheet to check with the ten. And then they'd write on their sheet what they counted. And you'd take, all right, number two. You put on your sheet what it would be. And you keep on then. You run that for 15 minutes. Then each one could grade the other paper, see who could count the fastest. 28. 27. That's pretty good. Try it again. I don't matter if you're just working in the garden or sewing something on a sewing machine. But this little gray matter all lined up, it's so much easier. You can just see the difference in your health. It gets your mind off your body. You're thinking of something else. Well, this is one of the most lovely countries, oldest mountain range in the United States. We got millions of acres of unused, worn out land right here in the Midwest, reached all the way to the Gulf. It to be responded to fertilization wonderfully. It could feed the world. So I got the idea, why not build little farm villages here, patterned after the kibbutzes in Israel? And let these unemployed and welfare people, even the uh, immigrants if we have to, where they can make a living for themselves. Alexander and Pulaski counties have an all oh, just unbelievable amount of people. Some of them are living, many of them, yet on dirt floors down there, families. These people would fall down and kiss this ground if they were allowed here. These are little hillsides, rocks on around here would be terraced and full of beautiful grapes, vegetables, fruits. Nice new home, the kids with the future, better health, dignity. But the government is just too indifferent. They're too wrapped up in politics. They just don't want anything to do with any work to it. It's pathetic. Isn't it? Isn't it? Makes you want to jump in a river. I asked a university up here to make a feasibility study for me, and that they never even. It wasn't courteous enough to tell me they didn't want to. They just walked over and left me. But I can't get anybody to listen to me. They just don't want to know. I don't see what keeps me from going crazy thinking of these things. Wayman, if you'd stand up with me now, I want to present you with your very own gold record. <laughs> This says it's a Nashville hit featuring Wayman Presley. It will serve as a tangible reminder that a warm and cordial welcome always awaits you in Nashville. Side one is we're proud you came. Side two is please come back again. <laughs> Now, I must say, I've got to take this back because one of the things about receiving a gold record is you've got to prove you earn it. So if you'll step up to the microphone here and pick any tune you want and sing to these folks, show that you deserve this gold record. Oh, my heavens. Are you ready now to do that? When you get ready, I'll sing one. Okay. Just a little bit. Well, I tell you, I've told some of it before that Elvis not the only press that ever made money singing. <laughs> I made up a song one time and got a job singing it for two dollars and I got started and they gave me six to quit. <laughs> so I made eight. And here's the way it sounded. I thought it sounded pretty good. It's about a young fellow got married. And after he got married, he was asking some of his friends asking me how he felt after the wedding that evening. And he I got a little cold, so if I just have to sing for this record, I sure will try it a little bit. But you hold your seats now. Don't, don't run. <clears throat> and they said, my old, <laughs> my old darling said to me, ain't you hungry, Joe? Is there anything you would like? I looked up and I said, don't you know? <laughs> 
Pickle Lily. Ah, ah, ah. He go, Mr. Carter go. Ah, he's ah, ah, I like pickle onions too. Pickle cabbage is all right with a little cold meat on Sunday night. Ah, I could do without them, but one thing that I do prefer is a little bit of cucumber, 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 a little bit of cucumber. <laughs> I know I am a senior citizen, or a double senior citizen, I guess, at my age, but I don't pay any attention to it. I just live the best I can. Had I been something besides just stand around here, give, take up space, 